Holmes wearing only a towel, assaulting his then girlfriend, Cassie Ventura, in a hallway at a Los Angeles hotel in March 2016. I think we can all agree that it was disgusting and horrifying. Did he put quite a number on Cassie? And do you fight back when he says up? Uh, you know? I would. I do have a slick mouth. Cause you're. <laughs> yeah. it's okay. Yeah, no, she talks slick a lot. She talks. We, 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 we work together well. And um. I don't know. I it, I guess the music will just have to speak for itself. So people hear it. Um, I'm really excited for it because I've been working on it for a long time. Yeah, what, what she, 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 she has great instincts. There's a lot of things that people just, that's all people can see. They can't like really see past that. And and I think that's what one of the things that's going to rock people to sleep this year on her. She, she has that, that, that special thing, you know, have intellectual love and it'll be coming out. Um, probably end of the year, top of the year, but we're gonna make sure we set it up right. We're gonna really do some unique strategic things. Right? Yep. He was in that man's house and he saw that man's wife who was like this. I was watching Puff. And then Puff was looking under. He saw this, this this white woman. It was bottles on bottles on bottles around her. It was lit. Puff jumped out. Me and Cassie sitting next to each other. My wife right here, Cassie right here. The nigga jumped off the bar, came over and said, yo, yo Cassie. Tomorrow, I want you to shave the side of your head. And I was like, I'm like, what the f kind of request is that? <laughs> like, so when I'm like, what? so when I look up there, this white woman's side of her head was shaved, my nigga. And the bitch looked good with it. So I was looking at Cassie, I was like, well, I, I was like, you're not about to do that, are you? She said, well, I mean, whatever Sean wants, I'm gonna do. A fake flyer, but I do remember when she came back and they went out to the club a couple of times. And it was a couple of times when they would stay in the studio to four or five in the morning. I wouldn't be allowed to go to bed until they left the studio. And, you know, being nosy, we all would just stay around and kind of watch and say, yo, how long do you think it's going to be? You know, how long do you think it's going to take before he breaks the safe? That's that type of conversation. And then uh, we all realized when uh, she didn't stay in her room one night that we said, okay, th th this is it. Right, and the two of them started to become serious. Right. Uh, he bought her a car. He got her an apartment in Manhattan that was walking distance to his right. apartment. Um, and she said that when he first showed her the apartment, her parents were there. Right. And, you know, they're a little skeptical, but they're proud that their daughter is doing well and she has this nice place and, you know, she has this, uh, you know, this rich boyfriend, but, and, you know, she, she's doing well financially and pursuing her career. Uh, are you around her parents at all? Yes. What was their overall vibe with the situation? Uh, I would say that at first, like you said, they was kind of skeptical. Um, they never really accepted the situation, but they wanted their daughter to be happy. So the father was a very quiet. The mother would be around a little bit more. Her brother would be around. And um, at the beginning of the relationship, it was like a watchful thing. But, you know, Puff has a way of sending them on trips and doing everything else for the family to like, to, to, like ease it. So everybody accepted it after, I would say around a year or two. It was just, just a regular occurrence. Okay, and she claimed that Diddy lavished her with designer clothes, jewelry, everything else like that. Yeah, she didn't, she didn't want for nothing. Yeah. But he did everything. Wasn't nothing allowed to be in her name. Oh. Her show money, nothing. Everything was funneled through his, through him. And he was managing her as well, right? Yeah, he was He was doing everything. It was yeah. a one-stop shop. Got if it. you wanted to book her, because I also, I was booking Diddy at that time for a lot of parties, so people would also come to me for Cassie. So I would have to go to him. How does one find themselves in a situation where the feds raid both your homes in search of something sketchy? Unless you're actually a criminal. Three states. Working in tandem, and they did not tell the officers who they were raiding. Mm -hmm. They went in tactical as they were instructed to. They didn't know they was raiding Diddy's house. 
The higher ups didn't tell anybody because they knew with Diddy being a, a fed informant that he had people in the force and they wanted to make sure that went through legit. So they ain't tell nobody whose houses they was going to. That's why you see the guns. That the cops didn't know that it was Diddy's house over there in Beverly Hills around the corner from uh, uh, the Playboy Mansion. They didn't know until they seen the kids. Rodney Ledrod Jones filed his 70-page lawsuit in the Southern District of New York on Monday. This person, however, his name is Rodney Jones. He lived, traveled, and he worked with Diddy as a producer, and he is alleging that he has hours upon hours of recorded footage and pictorial evidence, which has been included in this document, to support his claims. And I have to say, these claims seem very credible. Now, to be clear, Rodney, also goes by Lil Rod, uh, is suing Diddy and others, we're gonna get to who those others are, for $30 million, claiming that he was subjected to sexual misconduct for the duration of the production process of an album. It is a 70-page lawsuit that has been filed in the Southern District of New York, and he is claiming that while working on the album and living with Combs in New York, California, Florida, other locations, that Diddy repeatedly groped him, touching his, I'm sorry to say this guys, his anus and his crotch without consent and attempting to groom him into accepting a homosexual relationship by showing him explicit videos of others in Hollywood. Yes, they have named other artists claiming that homosexuality was a normal practice in the music industry. It's also claiming that Diddy would walk around the house naked and force him to watch him shower. Hello, everyone. Um, until further notice, I would not be performing at any gigs or anything like that. Um, for security reasons, my family, friends, and everyone close to me just feels like there's a lot of potential threats and everybody's just telling me what he's allegedly capable of. And, you know, it's very scary um, for myself and, you know, it has me worried about my kids and, you know, just sleeping with anxiety and, and different things like that so just moving forward um just want to pause on everything until we know that it's, it's it's clear and safe for me to come back outside of work i appreciate uh, you all for your love and support and everybody that knows me etc thank you so much love Following April Lampross's lawsuit against City, another model has accused Combs of drugging and sexual assault in care. On May 21st, model Crystal McKinney filed her lawsuit against Sean Combs, Bad Boy Entertainment Holdings, Sean John Clothing LLC, and Universal Music Entertainment Group. And the statute says that it revives any claims against, quote, a party who commits, directs, enables, we'll talk about that, participates in or conspires in the commission of a crime of violence gen motivated by gender, has a cause of action against such party in any court of competent jurisdiction. Lane explains that when she was 17 years old back in 1998, McKinney won MTV's first model mission competition. She was given a modeling contract and her career started to take off with her appearing in all sorts of major magazines. And then in 2003, when she was 22 years old, McKinney says she was invited to attend a men's fashion week event being held in New York. Now, the person who invited McKinney is only referred to in the filing as the designer. But according to McKinney, quote, the designer told plaintiff that he would be introducing her to Combs, which could advance her modeling career. The designer began to direct plaintiff's appearance as he sought to ensure Combs found her attractive. The designer then handpicked a black leather coat with a fur hood, a translucent chiffon, beige V-cut shirt, fur-lined handbag and jewel-encrusted jeans for plaintiff to wear to the event. Due to the traumatic events to occur later, plaintiff saved the unwashed clothing from that night in her closet where they remain in a plastic wrap. Wow. Then he said he had the power to help her career, continued to be very flirtatious. He also allegedly kept plying her with alcohol. And at the end of the night or the end of the dinner, he allegedly told her he wants to get to know her better. McKinney says she accepted her first hit of marijuana, but now believes it was laced with some other narcotic. McKinney claims that Combs then led her to a bathroom where he allegedly forced her to perform oral sex on him, despite her saying no. Quote, upon standing and walking, plaintiff felt more and more woozy and then lost consciousness. Plaintiff awakened in shock to find herself in a taxi cab 
heading back to the designer's apartment. The lawsuit says that after the alleged assault, McKinney didn't get as much work in modeling or acting. Eventually, she couldn't get any work at all. Upon information and belief, Combs had plaintiff blackballed in the industry and utilized his significant influence to impede plaintiff's career growth. Plaintiff became severely depressed as she began to blame herself for the assault and for sabotaging her own career. The assault led plaintiff into a tailspin of anxiety and depression. In or about 2004, plaintiff attempted suicide and was hospitalized. McKinney also states that she was married from 2006 to 2010, but according to her, her relationship fell apart because she had a mental breakdown connected to this traumatic experience. And this all goes, by the way, to the harm element of a lawsuit. What did you suffer? What are you seeking? McKinney's lawyers state in the complaint, quote, as a direct and proximate result of the aforementioned crime of violence and gender motivated violence, plaintiff has sustained and will continue to sustain monetary damages, physical injury, pain and suffering, and serious psychological and emotional distress, entitling her to an award of compensatory and punitive damages, injunctive and declaratory relief, attorney's fees and costs, and other remedies as this court may deem appropriate. When she met Mr. Combs, Ms. Lampro shared with him her dreams of working in the fashion industry. And Mr. Combs promised to mentor her and help her by introducing her to music and fashion industry executives, as well as assisting her with finding work. Mr. Combs love bombed her. He showered her with gifts and flowers as evidenced by one of the cards that accompanied the flowers that Mr. Combs sent Ms. Lampros for Valentine's Day in 1994 photo of the card from the New York florist, The Daily Blossom, says, Happy Valentine's Day, love Puffy. Mr. Combs went so far as to invite Miss Lampros to his first Father's Day celebration, and a picture of that invitation was included in this complaint as well. Now, from there, the complaint says that what started out as a love-bombing, flirty relationship quickly went south. This is according to Lampros. Quote, upon information and belief, What Mr. Combs displayed as kind gestures quickly manifested into an aggressive, coercive, and abusive relationship based on sex. These acts were not isolated to the state of New York as Mr. Combs would fly Miss Lampros to Atlanta to see him, where they would spend time together. Miss Lampros would also fly to Miami to see Mr. Combs at his home. The filing includes two photos of Lampros purportedly at Combs' home in Florida, According to Ms. Lampros, Mr. Combs had a terrible temper and often threatened to harm her if she failed to do what he said, if he witnessed her talking to other men, or if she failed to take his phone calls. According to Ms. Lampros, she was also not allowed to talk about her relationship with Mr. Combs to anyone because he didn't want anyone to know he was seeing her because she is a white woman. Conservative political commentator and author Candace Owens supported Kanye West's old conspiracy theory about Diddy. I'm not, I remember Pac, you know, used to talk about me. He didn't know me, but he's talking about me. And he, I mean, people, right when I say that, insert clip here. Tupac told me back in the days, you know, you had to get your money right and, and then you go to war. So I'm going to war, you know, I don't, I don't have, I don't have endless resources. I only have like maybe, you know, honestly, only maybe $120 million in my account. Everyone knows the exact quote, the exact that I'm, that I'm referring to. If you've seen those pocket interviews, you can just insert clip mm-hmm. there. Cause I don't want to miss out. I don't want to be dead when the world starts getting good. I want to see it. Poison me and by the way, Y'all done already fuck with me so much. Y'all already black mirrored me. You already made everybody think I'm crazy. You already took my family away. You already separated all my friends. I don't got no celebrity friends. Because when I was on TV, on Instagram saying, I don't know where my child is. And the Kardashians kidnapped my daughter in public. And I didn't have the address of my child. None of these niggas that want to say something Travis now. Travis gave you the address, though? Travis gave me the address. Right. But as far as Meek Mills, no. Puff Daddy, whoever, none of these niggas. All you fake hard niggas, fuck you. Wait, Come, wait, no, no, wait. hold on, hold on. Okay. All you fake hard niggas, fuck you. Right. You know what I'm saying? Right. I don't give a fuck who, because you can't shoot nobody anyway. And the reason why you got talks because you did a deal, you fucking fed. You know what I'm saying? That's why you got to come at me, because part of the deal, for you to be a do all that, 
and get out of jail is that you promise that you're gonna go pull my co-car. So y'all niggas shut the fuck up about me. Now let me say it calm. You niggas shut the fuck up about, you shut the fuck up about Michael. Right. The allegations and the problems keep piling up. The situation is about to reach its climax and we are all at the edge of our seats.